6,000 years is how long it would take if I started training GPT-4 on the latest and greatest graphics card from NVIDIA, the A100. So how did OpenAI accomplish this in just 90 days? Well, they used some nifty parallel algorithms to spread out the training across 25,000 GPUs. There are three main strategies commonly used to spread out a machine learning training job across two, four, eight, or even thousands of GPUs. Data parallel? Pipeline Parallel, and Tensor Parallel. Today, we'll discuss how each of these large-scale distributed algorithms lets AI supercharge humans to reach new heights of ingenuity. Let's start with the basics. Data Parallelism. I have a brand new ML server here with two RTX 3090s. That's right. I listened to your guys' feedback and decided that the rig with the RTX 4080 Super is better suited for gaming and video editing. All the software that I installed from last time though is still the same. Now let's make these GPUs go burn. Imagine I have a dataset and a model loaded up on one GPU. The basic way to train a model involves dividing the dataset into batches. For each batch, we first perform a forward pass through the network, calculate the loss, then perform backpropagation to compute the gradients, and finally, update the network parameters by stepping our optimizer. Data parallelism splits the workload across multiple GPUs. This way, our lonely GPU gets a friend, helping share the burden of the dataset. The model is fully duplicated and is stored in each GPU's VRAM. Each GPU processes a portion of the data simultaneously. Let's take separate batches from the dataset and give one to each GPU. Each GPU then performs an independent forward pass, loss calculation, and backward pass. But before stepping with our optimizer, we need a synchronization step. Without it, each GPU would train independently, negating the benefits of having multiple GPUs in the first place. During synchronization, we take the gradients from each GPU and average them. Remember, these are different because each GPU processed different training batches. This new set of average gradients is then sent back to all the GPUs. Each GPU receives the same set of gradients, ensuring they are synchronized. This operation is known as an all-reduce, a communication primitive that GPUs use to communicate. PyTorch employs Nickel, or NVIDIA's collective communication library, to gather gradients from each GPU, average them, and distribute the final result back to each GPU. I won't be diving more into Nickel in this video, but if you're interested in learning more, let me know down in the comments below. As we explore more parallelism strategies, we'll see that minimizing communication is crucial. Anytime our GPUs spend talking to each other, it's time they're not crunching numbers. Let's chit chat more work, please. The cool thing about data parallelism is that it scales seamlessly to four GPUs, eight GPUs, or any number of GPUs. Just ensure each GPU gets its own batch of data to train on. While I don't have eight GPUs, let's see the benefits of having a second one. If you look more into this on your own, you'll probably run into data parallel and distributed data parallel. DP, or data parallel, uses threads to manage multiple GPUs, making it only viable for one machine and is susceptible to slowdowns from Python's global interpreter lock. In contrast, DDP, or distributed data parallel, uses multi-process parallelism, allowing us to bypass the gill and utilize multiple machines, each with multiple GPUs. Thankfully, DDP's speedups can still be enjoyed even on a single machine. If you have a second GPU lying around, you can easily put it to work with DDP. Let's see how. There are a couple of easy ways to do this, including PyTorch's own DDP module and Hugging Faces Accelerate library. Since Accelerate requires fewer lines of code, let's use it to speed up the neural gradients field training from my last video. For those who missed it, we're training a neural network to render a 3D model of a Cybertruck simply by giving it some 2D images. All we need to do is modify these four lines in our current training code. Accelerate has this neat accelerator object that wraps our model, optimizer, and data loader. In one fell swoop, the library handles all of the distribution for us. The accelerator.backward loss line will ensure that our gradients are synchronized across all of our GPUs before we step our optimizer on the next line. After we start training with the accelerator, CLI, NVIDIA SMI shows us both GPUs are cooking. Comparing the training times between one RTX 3090, my RTX 4080 Super, and both RTX 3090s, we see massive speedups with DDP. It's about a 40% speedup, which isn't exactly the 50% you might expect, but this was with minimal optimizations. The main additional overhead with DDP is the minimal synchronization cost before stepping the optimizers, along with sharding the dataset. I hope I've convinced you that DDP is pretty cool, so why not just stop here? Well, there's one major limitation. 
our model has to entirely fit in our GPU's VRAM. If our smallest GPU, let's say, has 16GB of VRAM, our model can't be bigger than that. Each RTX 3090 has 24GB of VRAM, which is great for some simple ML projects, but there's no way GPT-40 or Tesla's FSD is fitting in here. Well, if we're dealing with models that can't fit in a single GPU's memory, we need a way to split the model across multiple GPUs. So, let's cut it vertically. Seems simple enough. We'll put this first half on one GPU and the second half on the second GPU. Congrats everyone, we have pipeline parallelism. This was originally introduced in the GPipe paper from 2018. Our forward pass looks pretty similar. We pass our data to the first layer and propagate it forward. However, when we get to the last layer on GPU 1, we need to communicate those activations to the next GPU. This is the only additional overhead introduced. After the last GPU calculates the loss, the same process applies to the backward pass. As you might expect, pipeline parallelism can easily scale to any number of GPUs. This allows for models of an arbitrary size to be split up conditional on the accumulated VRAM of all of your GPUs being large enough. This is a much more relaxed constraint than DP, which was limited by the VRAM of a single GPU. However, there is one major issue. When GPU 1 is cooking, GPU 2 is sitting idle, waiting for GPU 1 to finish, and vice versa. This is a natural byproduct of the sequential nature of the layers of a neural network. This problem only gets worse as we increase the number of GPUs. With 8 GPUs, 7 of them are sitting idle at any given time. That's why the GPipe paper went on to introduce micro-batching, where we split our batch into smaller chunks. We then pass each micro-batch through the model. GPU1 processes the first micro-batch and sends the activations to GPU2. While GPU2 works on the first micro-batch, GPU1 can then begin the forward pass for the second micro-batch. Once GPU1 and GPU2 are done, they pass their activations forward, and GPU1 takes in the third micro-batch, and so on and so forth. Notice at the bottom how now multiple GPUs are being used at once. Once all of the forward passes are complete and the loss has been calculated, the backward pass follows the same staggered micro-batching as the forward pass. After the gradients from all the micro-batches are accumulated, just like we talked about during data parallelism, the optimizer takes a step. The whole goal here is to minimize the bubble, which can be seen on this diagram from the paper. The area of the bubble represents how much time is spent where all GPUs aren't at 100% utilization. There's also a method to interleave the forward and backward passes, which can provide some speedups by resulting in a smaller bubble called 1F1B. A basic implementation of naive pipeline parallelism might look like this in code. We assign each half of the model to a different GPU and transfer the activations between GPUs in the forward pass. In fact, PyTorch has a pipelining module that is also worth checking out if you're interested. Microbatching is very useful, but it leaves some performance on the table because we can't achieve a consistent 100% utilization of all of our GPUs. You might be wondering to yourself, since we cut the model vertically, what happens if we try to cut it horizontally? Well, then we have tensor parallelism. Tensor parallel was originally introduced by the Megatron paper. To understand how this works under the hood, we need to dive down to the matrix multiplication level. Let's take these two matrices. On the left, we have a 3x6 matrix, and on the right, we have a 6x4 matrix. Our result will be a 3x4 matrix. Typically, we would just calculate the result by taking the dot product of this row and this column, and this row and this column, and so on and so forth. Since these dot products are independent from each other, we can already perform them in parallel. This is the reason why GPUs have revolutionized machine learning in the first place. But if we're limited on memory and can't fit the entirety of these two matrices along with the output in VRAM, we need to use multiple GPUs. If we have two GPUs and this operation consists of 24 independent dot products, what if we just send 12 of those dot products to the other GPU? We duplicate the left matrix and split the second matrix by its columns, resulting in these two separate matrix multiplication operations. After placing each on a separate GPU, we can synchronize the results and concatenate them to yield our original result. This is called column parallelism because the right matrix is split by its columns. The nickel primitive used is called an all gather because we're not summing or averaging the results across the GPUs, but rather simply concatenating them. In a neural network context, the left matrix would be the inputs to a layer and the right matrix would be the weights of a layer. Another way to split up this calculation is by the rows of the right matrix. This involves splitting the left matrix vertically and the right matrix horizontally. We send each matrix multiplication to a separate GPU, resulting in two 
matrices that are the same size as our output. Then, for the synchronization step, we perform an element-wise addition to get the final result, which if you recall from earlier, is the all-reduce nickel primitive. Although we're adding this time rather than averaging. The amazing part is that if you have an MLP of several layers, you can chain column parallelism and row parallelism through the network. The outputs of a column parallel operation is the input to a row parallel operation, and vice versa. This means you split the model's weights alternating between vertical and horizontal splits, and then you distribute them to the GPUs. Then just once at the beginning, you distribute the inputs and synchronize the final activations only at the end. Synchronization overhead is the enemy here, so the less often we need to synchronize, the better. The fact that our model can remain in this split state without adding much communication overhead is a huge boon for training times. Here are the classes for simple column parallel and row parallel implementations, along with a class that uses both for consecutive sets of matrix multiplications. I won't dive deeper into them, but I encourage you to read the code and see how it visually matches the animations. Now for my favorite part. Let's talk about how you can actually combine all three. Take this network as an example. Let's say that I have eight GPUs to train on. I can first split the network vertically with pipeline parallelism. Then I can split the network horizontally with tensor parallelism. And finally, I can duplicate the network with distributed data parallelism. This results in eight chunks that I can distribute to each of my eight GPUs. Training then commences like how you'd expect. The optimal configuration of DP, TP, and PP can vary wildly across model architectures and the GPU clusters network topology. This is where papers like Galvatron come in, introducing the concept of automatic parallelism. It uses some neat heuristics along with a dynamic programming algorithm to strategically prune the search space of all potential configurations to automatically find the best one. One of the heuristics this paper uses is that it always uses PP across quote, device islands, which are essentially clusters of nodes that are far apart. Communication with any single cluster will always be faster than across clusters, so it's optimal to use PP here because of its minimal communication overhead. Remember, in PP, we're simply transferring activations between large chunks of our model, not the model parameters themselves like in DP, or the fine-grained activations between individual matrix multiplications like in TP. Another piece of insight the paper finds is that DP is preferred when the model parameters are small, because because then we can afford to transfer the model parameters. When the model parameters are large, however, TP is preferred because then we can split the model parameters across GPUs within a single cluster. This article from Hugging Face has a neat summary at the bottom that outlines when to use what strategy. Check it out if you're interested. Also, as you read more resources on these topics, you'll oftentimes find model parallelism as an umbrella term for both tensor parallelism and pipeline parallelism. So be sure to keep that in mind. In the real world, these three parallelism strategies are typically wrapped by libraries that offer an additional suite of features and optimizations. Some advanced libraries are FSDP or fully sharded data parallelism, DeepSpeed, and Megatron LM. However, understanding the core parallelism strategies are a prerequisite to learning about these more advanced implementations. There are so many topics that I didn't get to cover today, such as Nickel, Automatic Parallelism, and the advanced libraries, and much more. I wanted to simply introduce the concept of using multiple GPUs for training large-scale ML models. If you guys are really interested in more content like this, please let me know down below. Anyways, thank you so much for making it until the end, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.